Many athletes have used their platform to shine a light on issues they really care about, from religion to race to gender equality to criminal justice reform. When speaking out, they can jeopardize their careers, their financial st stability, and even their team's feeling of unity. Some athletes are still paying the price today for their activism decades ago. Others are now celebrated for standing up to injustice. To kick us off today, here is a quick take on the long, defiant history of athletes and activism. Sports and activism are woven into the American experience. Oftentimes, sports has been the leader when it comes to social change and when it comes to societal change. What sports often does is it provides a spotlight to issues that are often being discussed in smaller communities, often hidden away without media coverage. When athletes become involved, it becomes hard to ignore the larger social issues. Robinson is now more than a ball player. He is, by circumstance, a representative of his race. Bill Russell, the man, is someone who stood up for the rights and dignity of all men. When a restaurant refused to serve the black Celtics, he refused to play in the scheduled game. Because sports gives us as close to a meritocracy as we can think of in this society, it often can be a leader in terms of changing how we in society view one another. In this political climate that we're in, it's become more important for athletes to be activists today. I think they see the danger of what happens when the people who have been blessed with the most, when they become disinterested in the everyday struggle. Please welcome Damian Thomas and John Carlos here with Atlantic staff writer Jamel Hill. Thank you all for joining us. Now, Dr. Carlos, now you can't walk out that cool. <laughs> <I'm> struggling. <laughs> Um, as we saw from the video, uh, sports has been such a powerful vehicle for change and seems to be very conducive to activism. Why do you guys think that is? I think today it seems like sports are more conducive to activism, particularly because we have a situation where athletes are more empowered. Certainly if you think about the union protections that the NBA players have, the NFL players, Major League Baseball, I think that's a major part of why, why athletes can be a little bit more socially engaged because they fought for the right to have, have strong unions. And, and I think that's a, a point that we often forget. I would think that the athletes today are finding them, themselves in terms of who they are and what their worth, they worth is. Uh, I think that they realize that they're the voice for the voiceless. They remember the communities that they came from. They remember where they've risen to, but they realize that their problems are still as great as it was before they were recognized as, as athletes. How do you all measure uh, the impact that athletes have when it comes to activism? I think it goes far and wide. Uh, you know, an athlete is recognized universally. Uh, as well as the President of the United States. I mean, you can look at Michael Jordan or Muhammad Ali or Jackie Robinson or Jack Johnson. All of them had a voice. These youngsters today have a voice and they realize that they have to protect the rights of those young individuals that's coming behind them. I think one of the ways in which you measure it is the extent to which we see social change. I think. What we have to remember about athletes is athletes don't tend to lead social revolutions. They respond to them. And so what happens is that people are on the ground in, in a place like Ferguson in New York after, after the, the murder of Eric Garner. And when athletes become involved, what often is a conversation taking place in a localized community becomes a national conversation. It becomes something that people 
can't ignore. And I think that's, that's when athletes' involvement is most powerful and impactful. It, it just helps enlarge the conversation. Now, Damien, you have the difficult job, but I'm sure obviously the rewarding job uh, as the curator of sports at the uh, National Museum of African American History of having a, a large say in who gets to be in the museum. So how do you decide, given that there are so many athletes throughout history who have used their platform for social change? It's tough. <laughs> it's a tough task. Um, I think the first thing is that the gallery is not a hall of fame. So it's just not merely about chronicling the idea that African Americans can run fast and jump high. But it really is about the larger political, social, and cultural context of athletic engagement. The first thing that, that I do is I think about the gallery as, as one of 12 stories. The museum has 12 galleries. And sports is an entryway. And you hope that, that, that at least one of the galleries resonates with someone. So when it comes to thinking about, about which athletes sort of get involved, I try not to think about it that way. And it's one of the things, if you go to the gallery, you'll notice that, that the rooms are divided in terms of basketball, football, baseball. And what I tried to do is to think about the larger contributions of that sport to this, to this struggle for greater rights and equalities. But you also have to respect your visitor and understand that the visitors want to see individual stories. And that's why in the back we have the, the what's known as the Michael Jordan Game Changers Hall, where we tell more individual stories. And also what you have to do is balance. You have to balance time periods. You have to balance social causes. You have to balance uh, different sports and things like that. And what you just hope to do is to come up with something that is representative more so than comprehensive um, for, for athletic engagement. By the way, thank you for giving me one of the best not so humble brags because I can tell people I'm in the museum. Because <laughs> uh, when you go in there, there's videos that play and I happen to be in one of those videos. You're just not in the videos. You are starring. Yeah. You're playing a starring <laughs> role in this gallery. I, well, it was interesting because years ago when I sat down with you, I don't think it really sunk in how important it was. So I'm glad I was able to sound reasonably intelligent in, my, in most of those videos. Um, now, speaking of videos, if you guys notice, um, in the video that was played before we, we took the stage, there was a, a young gentleman raising his fist on an Olympic medal stand, which would be obviously Dr. Carlos. Um, now, some of us in the room are old enough to know that full story, uh, but there's a lot of people in this room who don't know that full story. So uh, would you please do us the honor of explaining what went into your decision uh, 51 years ago, and last year was the 50th anniversary, uh, 51 years ago um, to execute one of uh, the most memorable, some could argue the most memorable protest of, of all time when you talk about um, an athlete's involvement. So talk about that decision in 1968 uh, that you and Tommy Smith decided to raise your fist on the medal stand. Oh, you know, we was at the pivotal point in history. You know, uh, I think we had so much strife going on throughout the world uh, dealing with racial issues and social issues. As young athletes, we felt that we had a significant role in this because we traveled the world to represent America. Uh, we saw what was happening in America to people of color, blacks in particular. We felt that we wanted to make a statement uh, of some sort, maybe to withdraw from the Olympic movement altogether, say we'll take a step back and not go to the Olympic Games. So we proposed a possible Olympic boycott. But there were so many young athletes that felt, man, I've trained all my life. You know, I promised my kids I was going to go to the Olympics. My community is counting on me. We didn't have the right to tell these individuals to say, man, you must vacate that thought and step back. So we decided to have a vote. But before the vote, we decided that we would go and research and study to, to have a foundation so when they come and stick that microphone in your face, you can speak on the issues. When we realized that these individuals was not on the same level we were, our next venture was to educate them to make them understand why it was necessary to potentially create a boycott of the Olympic Games. 
But yet and still, through the education, it's hard to tell an individual, man, we want you to make this sacrifice. So we took a vote, and they voted to go. Uh, I was upset that they voted to go because I felt it was so significant if we'd have stuck together and, and uniformly said we choose to step back and say, you know, we love representing America, but we would want America to represent us as well. Then we decided after they decided they wanted to go, well, I'm going to stay home for one, John Collins, that was my thoughts. But there's a creator in this universe, and he projected to my mind, said, well, John, if you stay home, someone's going to go in your spot well, they represent you the way you need to be represented. Then I was psyched up to get ready to make that team. I went on, I made the team, we went through the rounds, uh, rounds process of elimination, you might say. And we got to the quarter semi and I decided that I wanted to make a statement. I'm here at the games, but I can't just merely go and win a medal and get on the victory stand and just be there like everything is just peachy cream. So I decided that I would approach Mr. Smith, we collaborated, we agreed, yes, we will make a statement. And then we brought artifacts together, the gloves, the socks, the scarf, the beads, the Olympic Project for Human Rights button. And we approached the victory stand. Mind you now, we have re been receiving threats throughout that two year period leading up to the games. But my thoughts were, well, they might take my life, but they can never take this demonstration away. Once it's done, it's done. I felt that was far more important than my life because when I came into the games, I didn't go to the games to make a statement for John Carlos. I meant to make that statement for my kids and their peers, for your kids, for a lot of you youngsters that's out in the audience today. That statement still registers 51 years later. So it was necessary to make a universal statement for people to open their minds and begin to challenge themselves in terms of what type of individual, what type of human being I am. Because I can't change it by merely putting my fist to the sky. We as a society have to change the ills of society. So this is the part I always think gets lost about that entire experience. It's what happened to you guys after you came home. Well, one, you were dismissed from the team, correct? Yes. You were dismissed from the team. Um, has Brent Musburger ever apologized to you? Because Brent Musburger, who was on air as the announcer, uh, a big reason why I tell people even now as they're commentating on Colin Kaepernick and other sports and social issues, be careful what you say, because it may live in eternity in a way that will embarrass you years later. And Brent Musburger called you and Tommy Smith, uh, storm tr black stormtroopers. I think that was the phrase that he black, used. Black skin stormtroopers. Black skin stormtroopers on television. So he uh, has he apologized to you yet? Well, you know, Brent Mus Musburger doesn't even exist in my mind, so I don't even know who he is. <laughs> you know, uh, he, he Good answer. He didn't mean anything to me 51 years ago. He doesn't mean anything to me today because he's been proven to be wrong. Uh, the earlier part you was asking me about. Yeah, the fallout. What happened once you guys got back to the States? Well, when we got back to the States, let's say when we went to the Olympic Games, the sun was shining, it was bright, we could see the rainbows in the sky. And when we got back home, it was chaos. It was stormy weather, you know, just lightning everywhere. But one of the most important things that I had to learn is that those individuals that was supposed to be your peers and your friends that were supposed to have an understanding, they begin to step away and move away from you. You start to sniff yourself to see, is, am I smelling bad? Do I have cock on my shirt? Why are my friends leaving? It took two years for me to realize that they weren't leaving, leaving because they didn't have any love or respect for me or like me. They were leaving for fear of reprisal, the same type of reprisal that we had to endure for and I say we, I'm talking about Tommy Smith, Peter Norman, as well as John Carlos, for 40 plus years. But I would go for another 140 years to do that again if it was necessary. Hmm. You know, you can, as a young individual, this is the way I used to frame this thing years ago. I was a young individual, I was idealistic, I had a paradigm in terms of how society could be, how we could love one another and help one another to make this a beautiful earth. And I felt like I was on top of this 
pine tree, the highest pine tree you could imagine. And I felt like I was on the highest branch. And I knew what I was about to do was going to disturb or upset or infringe upon other people's rights. And I felt that that branch would break, but I didn't have any concern about the branch breaking because there was so many branches underneath that understood why I was there. And they would catch me when that branch broke. But I learned they would retract those branches. So when we took the fall, we took the fall and we hit the ground so hard we bounced almost back to the top. But yet and still, it was worth doing it. And I realized at the same time that that guy that made this statement, every man's an island within himself. And I had to think for myself in terms of what's my role in this life that God gave me? Is it merely for me just to be a superstar and stick my chest out and say, yeah, I'm the greatest? No, nah, I want all individuals to have that same opportunity and, and be able to challenge themselves to be the best they can be and defy anyone that tries to stop them. Tell them that they don't have a right to go to this university and they don't have a right to go to this community or you can't get into this hospital. I think about, you know, Charles Drew. And uh, I think about this man inventing blood plasma, a black man. And merely because he was a black man, the invention that he made, he lost his life based on the color of his skin. So when you sit back and think about that, as well as black soldiers that went to the First World War, such as my father, and came home and was disrespected, think about Harry Belafonte coming there as a young man and they're telling him that he couldn't swim in the public pool. Think about John Collins as a little kid wanting to go to the Olympics. The first time he heard about the Olympics, he heard about someone swimming the English Channel. And I said, Pop, what's the English Channel? I want to swim it. And then I heard about the Olympic Games. Well, Daddy, what's the Olympics? Well, that's where the greatest athletes in the world come together to see who's the strongest physically and who's the strongest mentally. Well, Pop, do they have swimming? Yes, son. I'm going to be the first black to represent America. And he told me after a year, because he saw I was very serious about getting ready to make that team. And he came to me and he told me, he said, son, you're never going to be able to go to the Olympics as a swimmer. What are you talking about, dad? I'm the best, I'm the best in New York. I said, why can't we go? And he put his hand out and he rubbed his hand. I thought he was rubbing a bug bite. But actually he was telling me just merely because of the color of one's skin, they cannot be in this planet what God intended for them to be. My whole life I've been trying to change that. For the rest of my life, I will continue to try and change it. So we can all come together as we are in this audience together to be one. Damien, that history that Dr. Carlos just talked about, Charles Drew, uh, talking about the African-American soldiers, our history in general, American history, um, how can athletes use that history to inform their activism today? I think history is really important because what history does is it provides us lessons that we can draw from. And it also provides us with a certain strength to realize that no matter how bleak things seem today, that people have endured more, survived more, and come out and decided to fight. One of the most important moments I had in my own personal development is I was at an event with, um, with Randall Robinson, who founded a group called Trans Africa. And Trans Africa fought for the end of apartheid in South Africa. And it was founded in the early 1970s. And what he said is he said, when we started that fight in the early 70s, we never thought we would see the end of apartheid in our lifetime. And it happened 20 years later. And so just hearing him talk about that and seeing the lessons that, that I can draw from that is sometimes you gotta, you gotta fight even when you think you can't win. And I think that's one of the most important lessons from history. I just wanna tell people we uh, will be taking your questions. Um, we'll save a couple minutes at the end of this session to take those. So you might wanna start thinking about them and you can use, I think it's saldo.com uh, to also uh, to type in your questions and 
and they'll pop up on some screen, <laughs> and I'll uh, read them, and, and we'll all respond. Um, I, but uh, first, I want to ask you this, Dr. Carlos. Um, so you, you've seen a conversation. I, I mean, you, you know this all too well, um, despite the, the political nature of the times, despite all the injustice that was happening uh, when you were an athlete. Um, despite all of that, you were told in some effective way to just shut up and play your sport, right? Athletes a lot today are hearing the same thing. How do you respond to those people who feel like athletes, all they should do is worry about their athletic contributions and not the larger contributions that they can make to society? Well, I don't pay attention to people that don't make sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they, they didn't make any sense to Jack Johnson or to Jackie Robinson because they told them the same thing, to Paul Robeson, all of them, out there Gibson. All of them received that same note that they put under my door. Just shut up and play the game. But see, I, I look at it like this. You know, most of you guys out there in the audience, y'all born into this world and you want to make the football team or you want to make the basketball team, baseball team. Why? Because you want to get in the game. The concept of the game is what? To win. But there's other individuals in society that didn't go out to try and get on the team. But they was pushed into the game of life. That's the game that I'm concerned about winning. So I'm not concerned about those individuals who tell me just go out and play sports because before I was an athlete, I was a human being. When I die, I'm going to be that human being. I can't come here and say I'm here to serve just to be on the athletic field and have no concerns about what happened once I leave the athletic field. Individuals will look at John Carlos another 150 years from now if we're still spinning in this, in this world, and they would look at me in terms of me being a blueprint. They would turn the pages one day and say, someone did stand up. Someone did make a statement. And that goes across the board. I don't care what your ethnic background is or what your sexual preference is. It goes across the board to say someone stood up against all odds to say that you're wrong and had no fear. See, because I always told people to say, man, you know, you can get killed. And I tell them, say, man, I was born dead. I'm fighting to live. All right? <clears throat> Again, you can go to slido.com if you have a question uh, for our panelists. And we have one question here already. Uh, this is for you, uh, Dr. Carlos. Can you speak about Peter Norman, his role in your protest, and how pivotal he was to that moment? Uh, Peter Norman, for you all that don't know, was the other person who was on the podium with John Carlos and Tommy Smith. Well, let me start by saying Peter Norman is my brother from another mother. <laughs> Let me start by saying also that Peter Norman was a very unique individual. He was a very talented individual. Uh, he was very uh, sure of himself in terms of his athletic abilities. When I met him, I looked at him as an athlete. It didn't take but five minutes to realize that I was looking at a man because Peter had values and concerns and morals about what was happening in Australia. Because we had some people of color in Australia too. And Peter was one white individual, like one little grain of sand in Australia that had compassion for those people of color in Australia. I didn't know this through any conversation that we had, but I knew Peter just based on what he showed me in terms of his character at the Olympic Games. We went, we ran, I remember running against him in the quarter semi and he tried to make a move on me, and I looked at him and waved him down, and, and at the corner of my eye, I catch him waving me back down. So I liked him right away because he showed that he had some true grit. But then, as we went on to matriculate on into the halls of the stadium and decided how we was going to formulate this demonstration, and Peter looked over, he said, what are you guys doing? He said, well, we're getting ready to make a statement. I said, let me ask you a question, Peter. Do you believe in human rights? And he looked at me and he smiled and he said that his mom and dad were Salvation Army workers all of his life. So of course I believe in human rights. I said, would you like to wear an Olympic project for your human rights button? And he said, sure. And he started reaching for mine. I had to pat him on his hand, get back. I'll get you one. 
He put the button on. He was so proud to put that button on because he understood fully what the button meant, what it represented. You had to have courage to wear that button. And he had all the courage in the world. Now, he stood on the victory stand with us. Tommy Smith raised his fist. John Collins raised his Smith fist. Peter Norman stood there at attention. Had total respect for our flag as well as the Australian flag but merely because he had an Olympic project for, for human rights button tacked on his sweatsuit. It's like he defied the white society because that represented people in peril, that button. He chose to stand with us. So when you think about what happened to Tommy Smith and John Carlos here in the United States, well, think about this Twinities. On the left side, they said, well, let's go whip up on Tommy Smith. On the right side, let's go whip up on John Carlos. So while they whipping up on me, he gets a rest. While they whipping up on him, I get a rest. Well, Peter Norman went back to Australia, and in my estimation, Australia was running parallel with South Africa in terms of attitude. So Peter Norman didn't get no rest. They beat him 24-7. 365, he never denounced us. He never stepped away from us. He never said one bad word about what he did in his life, and he took it to his grave. I will always have love and admiration and respect for Peter Norman in my heart and my soul. Um, we have time for one. Did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I did. I think this, this is a, a major point that Dr. Carlos is raising, the, the significance of South Africa. Because in 1964, the Olympic Committee kicked South Africa out of the Olympics because of apartheid. And then in early 1968, before the Games, they decided to allow South Africa to come back in. And that created a lot of controversy in the Olympic Project for Human Rights was instrumental in ensuring that Africa, excuse me, South Africa did not participate in the 1968 Olympics. Peter Norman faced a lot of prosecution because of that, that stand, because people, because Australia and South Africa were major allies. And when he wore that button, he was seen as criticizing um, Australia's most important ally. And so that was a, a major part of why he faced a lot of persecution. Uh, we have a, another question here um, real quick, uh, and I think it's a, a really important one. Uh, as a black star athlete in a predominantly white high school, what would you tell those black kids about overt racist comments and slurs? Well, I would tell them you have to rise above that. You know, like I said, they have people that's intelligent, and then they have people that's ignorant. And the ignorant people will make statements such as he's, or this individual's talking about. But you have to rise above that. You know, words uh, can always infringe upon your mind for you to think about. But if they don't put no physical hands on you, or if your life is not in threat, this is something that we're trying to overcome. So don't never let them stop you by calling you the N-word. That makes me want to drive even harder. Don't let them stop you because they tell you that uh, we don't want you sitting at this table. It drives you harder. Just be strong in who you are. You know, it's, it's something Michael Jackson, I talked to him years ago and he did a song called Man in the Mirror. And what I say is, Michael, you know, the problem that we have in society is that most people go to brush their teeth every morning, and brush their hair, wash their face, but they never got in touch with the person in the mirror. Find out who you are. Once you find out who you are, no one can stop you. We're so busy looking at everybody else and not paying attention to who we are. Once we realize our strengths, no one can stop you. You can move as high in this life that you want to go. See, that's, that's why you're better than me, because my advice might have been just totally, totally different. <laughs> That's why, that's why you're Dr. Carlos. <laughs> See, I'm too petty for that. That's why I don't even need to answer that question. <laughs> well, listen, I want to thank both of you all for this amazing conversation. Um, we have more amazing conversations, obviously, on the way. But I think uh, it would be remiss not to give them a round of applause for everything that's been said. <laughs> thank you for coming out. We love you.